Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we welcome you. We thank you for joining us at today's event hosted by uh, our Adrian Arch Latin America Center. Peter Schechter, our great leader, is, is here representing uh, that uh, center. Please note that our event here is on the record and also is being live streamed online for those of you on Twitter. I encourage you to follow along using hashtag ACTrade. Now, on behalf of the Atlanta Council family, we're absolutely delighted to host one of the most respected leaders on U.S. national security, Admiral uh, Michael Mullen. Admiral, thanks for being here with us, giving us your time and your expertise. We're delighted that you chose the Atlantic Council as a platform to discuss the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now, the TPP agreement represents a major economic and strategic breakthrough for the United States. The deal unlocks a host of opportunities for participating countries at a time when U.S. leadership in the world is being tested on multiple fronts. TPP presents us with an opportunity to secure our strategic interests and help shape the future of global trade. As a former U.S. ambassador to China and Singapore and twice a resident of Taiwan, I'm most in favor of the deal in in terms of what it represents for America's future in the Asia-Pacific region. Relationships that I believe will determine our destiny in the 21st century. The TPP agreement reaffirms our commitment to Asia, particularly at a time of uncertainty in U.S.-China relations. And above all, it provides an opportunity to influence the region based on higher standards of trade and more stable economies, leading to a more secure environment. TPP, however, has been politically divisive at almost every conceivable level and has proven to be a ripe target for critique during this election cycle. Now, here at the Atlantic Council, we believe TPP is important from a strategic standpoint as well, since the connection between security and economic growth in the Asia-Pacific region is undeniable. As part of our work on TPP, we've had the distinct honor to host events with U.S. Trade Representative Mike Froman, Deputy Secretary of State Tony Blinken. We've also held numerous panels with ambassadors from each of the participating TPP countries. Through our work and analysis, we hope to provide a legitimate forum like the one today to discuss some of the key issues coloring the debate and do our part to help move the needle just a little bit on TPP. Today's timely discussion with Admiral Mullen comes days before the International Trade Commission will be launching its report on TPP which should provide some additional insight on the agreement and its overall impact on the American economy. In just a few moments, I'll turn the stage over to Admiral Mullen. Following his remarks, director of our Adrian Arch Lat Latin America Economic Growth Initiative, Jason Marzak, will facilitate a moderated discussion with Admiral Mullen. Now, the Admiral is no stranger to the Atlantic Council. Back in 2008, as a matter of fact, we honored him alongside former Prime Minister Tony Blair with our Distinguished Military Leadership Award. That night, Admiral, you said that we live in a time of great challenge and of great uncertainty. Eight years later, the world is even more challenging and ever more uncertain. But being the visionary that you are, you ended your speech on an optimistic note. That same night, you spoke of partnerships. You said, and I quote, Partnerships are the very foundation of global security and stability for the future. It is a huge honor to host you back to discuss a very specific partnership, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now, Admiral Mullen is recognized by many as an honest broker and is considered one of, if not the most influential chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in our country's history. He held this position for four years under President George W. Bush and then President Barack Obama, which followed his service as Chief of Naval Operations. Admiral Mullen embodies a very bipartisan spirit the Atlantic Council stands for. Today, Admiral Mullen sits on the boards of General Motors, which is hard for me to say as a member of the board of Ford Motor Company, Sprint, and the Bloomberg Family Foundation, and is also a professor at the Woodrow Wilson School of International and Public Affairs at Princeton. He's also on the U.S. Naval Academy Foundation Board, where we both have the privilege of serving. I'd like to take a moment to congratulate you, Admiral, for your great career and for your contributions to our country's military and security leadership alike. Thank you once again for joining us. I'd like to turn the time over to you.
Well, it's a, a real pleasure to be here. I, I honestly don't come to town much anymore. I've enjoyed what will be uh, in uh, October five years of detaching myself from most of what's here. Uh, and I say that because uh, I, I am involved in this because I really think it's critical. Uh, and it's, for me, it's not, it's a very complex undertaking. I certainly understand that. And I applaud Mike Froman and the administration for exerting exceptional efforts to get it to this point. Um, uh, but it really hits at the heart, the TPP hits at the heart of, of literally my whole life. Uh, from the first time I deployed to the Western Pacific in 1969 to start to engage other countries around the world, particularly in that part of the world. Uh, and back then it was the Philippines and Japan, and certainly that's expanded uh, over the years. I would, and this combination of prosperity and security. I mean, I still, I still can see the dozen or so family members tacked up in a thatch hut, a uh, tin hut actually, at the Quay Wall in Hong Kong. Uh, and Hong Kong was the first vision that I had literally of, of those who have and those who do not have. And uh, that family and tens of thousands of family over the course of 43 years of war in the uniform. Basically, the reflection is they would like to raise their kids to a higher standard of living, and, uh, and whether it was a poor family like that or families in the middle class who are well off, certainly that's been universal, and I've seen it in countries that I've recently visited. That's, that's sort of one of those uh, universal constants. And I think TPP hits at the heart of that. What I didn't say about that family and so many others, it's a lot easier to do that if it's a secure environment, if there's no conflict going on. Uh, and that sort of, that linkage between security and prosperity that I've seen in so many families and so many countries around the world, it's absolutely vital. Uh, I, I want to say thanks to Ambassador, Governor, good friend John Huntsman, Huntsman, who I got to know actually before he went to China because he had two kids going to the Naval Academy and he came by to ask me what that was all about, introduced me to his family. But in particular, his focus on this continued service to our country where we're at a time where everybody needs to serve. Everybody needs to continue to try to make a difference. And to those here from the Atlantic Council that they would, that you would facilitate the the discussion of such a, a critical piece of work. That, again, that linkage between prosperity and security is, is vital. And it isn't what's interesting to me, while it clearly focuses at a time on the Pacific, uh, which is a part of the world that I believe is the economic center of the world for the 21st century, with the economies that are there uh, from Asia, from, and to include India, certainly Japan, Korea, uh, uh, and the United States. And I think the, the, I think the fact is that it, this involves over 40% of the world's GDP. Uh, as a Navy guy, I spent my life trying to make sure that those sea lines of communication remained open at a time we should never forget that some 90 to 95 percent of our commerce travels by those sea lanes. So having them open and having them secure, conflict-free is absolutely vital. I've actually run war games where we start to back those up here in our own country, and it backs up pretty badly in terms of, in a very short period of time, just in terms of our future. So that all gets back to having a secure environment, having a, a, a military which can enforce that uh, by presence and engagement, uh, but that's, that's a necessary, but I consider it to be insufficient. Uh, we've got to get the economic piece of this uh, and the prosperity piece of this uh, right for the future. I don't, have to, I don't think I have to go through all the numbers. We know the 12 countries are involved. We know how much the world's economy is involved in that. It's my view that uh, uh, sometimes when we 
when we try to cut off initiatives like this, we do this to almost cut off our nose to spite our face. In a world that, that maybe uh, um, geographically isn't getting any closer, but certainly in so many other ways, we are a global system now. We are a global economy. We are responsible for, with many other countries, global security. And I, the, the issue of who can do it and who can't, uh, it's, been, it's been a long time since I've thought the United States could do this alone anymore. We need partners. Uh, we need uh, like-minded uh, countries uh, and certainly something like TPP uh, is emblematic of that. Um, I was struck, um, I participate in a track two dialogue with Secretary Kissinger, Secretary Schultz, Secretary Rubin, uh, 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 Marty Feldstein, um, Steve Hadley, Tom Donlan, et cetera. I'm the only military guy on this. And we meet it with our Chinese counterparts about every 18 months or so. And we were there last November. It was my third meeting. I think it was the fifth meeting of the group. Uh, and I was struck by a couple things. One is the, the overall tone. And this was right at the time where actually the US Navy had sailed through the, ter through the uh, seas near the disputed islands, if you will, in international water. So I thought it would be a pretty uh, contentious meeting just because of that. Uh, I found it at that time to be actually the opposite. The discussions were good, and we covered all the very difficult issues. What One thing that struck me in particular about this, because of the TPP rollout at the time, was a willingness to discuss this between the United States representatives and the Chinese representatives. And I expected it to be incredibly contentious, and it, it wasn't. Now, I, I'm, so, I'm not going to speak for the Chinese. They can do that themselves. But what was just below the surface, from my perspective, in our discussions about this, was an understanding of interdependence that we have. I don't have to tell anybody in this room that we are more than a little dependent on each other economically. And uh, I actually have great hopes for that in the future. Somehow, despite current events and the, the buildup in the South China Sea, if you will, sort of using that as the indicator, that somehow it is the economic interdependence that will keep us from doing anything foolish from a conflict standpoint. Because uh, if we get in any kind of serious conflict, it will dramatically, uh, I think, affect the Chinese economy, the US economy, and the global economy. Um, so that interdependence was literally right below the surface, if you will, in these discussions that we had. Um, and I think the Chinese are trying to put together something called, I think it's called RCEP, which is a, the same kind of of uh, idea for uh, other countries. W what I see in terms of TPP is its ability to have an impact in workplaces in these 12 countries and more that we, I find it hard to imagine that we would be able to have that kind of impact or be involved in the writing of the rules, if you will, which would which will dominate, if this goes through, which will dominate a significant, a hugely significant portion of the global economy, which from my perspective has to impact in ways that we don't necessarily even understand yet, the global economy itself, back to the world, which is getting smaller and smaller. So I was really taken by that, uh, by the, the impact uh, or that discussion that we had uh, with the Chinese uh, in terms of their willingness to certainly uh, talk about this, and we did it in a way that we weren't, we weren't uh, uh, just sort of yelling past each other. Um, uh, at a time where clearly the Obama administration has refocused the balance to that part of the world, there are many challenges in that part of the world, but to me what underpins all that is our two economies, the two biggest economies in the world for the foreseeable future. The other thing, back to sort of this prosperity and security piece, and you see some of this now, 
This is just my own experience. When economies don't do well uh, at home, leaders have a tendency to lash out uh, in the international uh, uh, area, if you will, and that, that increases the business, that increases the interaction, that increases the potential for military confrontations. Um, and uh, as some economies right now are not doing as well as, uh, as they had hoped, some of the bigger economies, you certainly see some of that in that part of the world. Um, uh, we've got to figure out a way to be able to work together for the good of the, certainly for our own people in the United States, and all that means, and there are challenges associated with that, with what's happened in the last uh, 20 plus years, and I'm, I'm fully aware of that. And I think we need to do that better internally in terms of providing for our own people, making sure in a world that's going to change where the job market is changing, where jobs are going to go away, uh, making sure that we, in fact, have a much more positive and constructive impact on American citizens whose jobs are no longer secure uh, in the future as well. I just think that there's an inevitability to that. Uh, no matter what the resistance would be now, and I think an active, an actively addressing that uh, and leading that for our own citizens is hugely important as well. Lastly, while I, as I said, I'm for the most part enjoying not being in town uh, uh, with what it continues to happen here, I, I, I made a trip, and I know we're all focused on this, but I made a trip to Japan uh, in in January, and I talked to an awful lot of leaders in Japan, and there wasn't one that didn't want to know about Mr. Trump and in January. And certainly, I've been around the world enough uh, over time. The United States presidential election is always hugely focused uh, uh, on by people around the world. Probably in modern times, never more so than now. And it has to do with our leadership, and it has to do with uh, uh, certainty and uncertainty. Uh, it has to do with vision and where we're going and the impact that we're going to have. And we have clearly right now two starkly different views in many ways. Uh, this is, I don't want to be predictive here, uh, based on you know, most of the analysis on the presumptive nominees, uh, rec recognizing that one of them isn't over yet. Um, but we should never forget that uh, there's a, there's a, you know, countries all over the world, leaders all over the world, people all over the world that are going to depend on, more so than we realize, the output, uh, the results uh, of this election. Uh, I, for one, uh, and I'm not tracking this thing vote by vote, if you will. Um, uh, however, I think if it, it is... It is somewhat ironic that a Democratic administration is leading this effort and that certainly politically early on the headcount and the pushback is coming from Republicans who historic and historically it had, it, it's exactly the opposite. And that's yet again probably a perfect description of where American politics is right now uh, on this issue and on many other issues. And I'm not here to try to resolve that except to hope that leaders in both parties can, can get, if, if it's possible, and I don't know if it is, to, can get above the fray and do what is right for, I believe, the American people, for the people around the world that will, in the long run, make us much more competitive. Uh, clearly, if you look at previous trade agreements, it feeds competition. That's, that's right down the center of the plate for Americans. To me, it makes all the sense in the world. That's what we ought to be able to, that's the game we can play in. And we can win time and time again. Uh, and certainly in this world where inevitably things will continue to change, as we've seen. So I'm hoping, uh, and I don't hope against hope, but I'm hoping that we can somehow get our head, uh, heads above the fray here politically and, uh, and get this thing passed in time for a new administration to go into execution and resolve some of that uncertainty, political uncertainty, economic uncertainty, and when that occurs, military uncertainty uh, that puts the U.S. military and others, but the U.S. military in particular, to work 
more often than I'd care to say. Um, so uh, again, I appreciate your time. I appreciate the focus on this. Uh, the, the whole issue of prosperity and security are inextricably linked. They are never more so than now for us. And my worry is that if we don't get this done now, we're at least a decade away, if even that close, for its approval down the road in a global economy that I think speaks to exactly this kind of undertaking. Thank you. Everyone, thank you very much for those incredibly illuminating comments. This is the kind of insight I think that's often missing today, but I would say always on display here at the Atlantic Council. Um, again, I'm Jason Marzat, director of the uh, Latin America Economic Growth Initiative, and the Admiral has graciously agreed to have a very short conversation and then leave the rest of the time for uh, questions uh, from, the, uh, from the audience. Actually, he told me beforehand he's not really interested. He's interested more in your questions than in my questions, so we'll make sure to leave plenty thought, of time. I thought it was your question. Uh, my, my question. <laughs> Um, so feel free, to, feel free to continue tweeting. Use the hashtag uh, ACTrade. Um, and well, the first question is about the underlying questions today, swirling today about U.S. commercial engagement overall. Um, on Wednesday, the International Trade Commission is going to be releasing its report looking at the economic impact of the agreement. But as you mentioned in your remarks, leadership in international trade is also, of course, fundamental to national security. And this is a narrative that's oftentimes missing today in our, in our political dis discourse. W what is your message to those who believe that pulling back from commercial engagement would actually put the U.S. on stronger footing? I, well, for, I, I mean, basically, first of all, I'm not an economist, and I obviously haven't spent my life in the private, in the private sector. Um, but I am somebody that believes very strongly that uh, the more we isolate ourselves, the worse shape we're going to be in, both economically as well as from a security standpoint. Um, in a world that's demanding engagement, uh, in a world that's demanding competition, and in a world that creates opportunity, I think is out there in terms of creating opportunities for competition, and actually to a great degree with TPP, opportunities for competing with rules that we understand, that, that we by and large for the most part compete with. So again, it sort of, it, it comes right at who we are. Uh, it, will there be very tough issues associated with it? Absolutely. Will there be job losses associated with it? Uh, uh, clearly. Uh, that's where I get into uh, the, the whole idea of how do we take care of our own people? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the, the whole issue of how do we invest, how do companies invest, even companies that are losing people, how do companies invest in their people's future? And how do we take some of the enormous profits that we have in companies throughout the country, our own country, how do we take some of those, peel those off, and invest in people? Because in the end, that's what workers are most concerned about. They're concerned about their jobs, their families, the whole security aspect of that, and is there a way that we can is there a way that we can do that a whole, there, there are many ways. We, I think we can do that a whole lot better than, than uh, we have in the past uh, and that we are obligated to do that, to make sure that their futures are secure. All of that, I think in the long run, I, I think if, you know, sort of putting up walls or coming home or not participating internationally, it, it may, there may be some short-term benefit to that, but I think the long-term view uh, the, the, is the one that would really be in jeopardy. This town isn't known for its long-term views uh, of late. Uh, actually, it could, we could go back some time. And I, I just think having a long-term view, and this is a long-term issue. I mean, I found it ironic that in its creation, TTP has also generated questions from Europe about where is TPP going, and I think it's TTIP. Yep, is, TTIP there, yes. is there something there that we ought to be working together? And I, I just think, you know, I mean, I said this, I'll say it again for emphasis. I mean, just a, economic links just drive outcomes. They drive outcomes, and, or lack thereof, uh, they will uh, drive negative outcomes. And, and again, that gets back into my world where the work goes up dramatically if the economics are, are pretty bad. I mean, I, I'll just tell you, from my beliefs, one of the countries I worked most 
uh, I spent an awful lot of time on trying to establish a relationship that was a military relationship was Brazil because of its economic engine. And yes, they're going through some very difficult times, but it's just, I feel so strongly about that kind of uh, having, a, having a linkage there because they're such an economic engine for Latin America and the rest of the world, but certainly for Latin America. And I think and I hope and think that they'll come back. But that's just another example of, of how strongly I feel about this, the, the potential impact. Yeah, of this. and we're also, uh, the R Center, incredibly bullish on Brazil's uh, medium term prospects yeah. as well. And as you mentioned in your remarks, prosperity and security are incredibly yeah. inter intertwined. I want to ask you about the um, something we don't want to think about, but the consequences of Congress not ratifying the agreement, uh, whether it's later this year or whether it's under a, a new president. Um, and that, that would be, again, not ratifying agreement in which the U.S. is essentially writing the rules of yeah. global trade yeah. uh, at, at a time in which the, uh, the WTO is not moving forward on, on, on doing that. What, what message would that send? If, we, if Congress does not ratify the agreement this year or maybe next year, what message does that send about U.S. leadership to Asian countries and also to the many Latin American countries who increasingly see the United States as an important partner? I think it's a global message. I don't just think it's the 11 other countries that are, that are there for us in this. Uh, and, uh, I, I, and, and we're now, I mean, we've progressed now where this is, at least for the relatively near future, this is sort of a one or a zero. Either it's, it's yes or it's no, because if it's no, it's going to be no for a while. Uh, and to me, that just reinforces the isolation in, in probably what I consider to be the most critical uh, uh, undertaking or capability uh, that we have as a country, which is our, which is our economic power. Um, and I don't think you can just undo that overnight. And particularly, if it doesn't pass now, the political capital, and there will be, as they are, uh, as they're always, there'll be political capital which will have to be expended to make this happen. Uh, and if it doesn't happen, then the political capital to, I don't know that, it, that to turn it around, uh, I don't know that it exists in the town. And that's the, that's the sadness I've got when politics is driving so much of what goes on here now to a degree that I, I personally haven't observed, uh, let's say, since the, since the mid-90s. I've, I've watched that just get get cranked up higher and higher and higher. And I worry that we're just unable to let go of the politics and do the substance, when the substance is the right thing for the American people and uh, for the future of the country. So I that your message is this is a, about a lot more than trade. I mean, if we don't, if we don't pass oh, yeah. this agreement, yeah, it, no, it's, it the, the consequences are for much further reaching. So I want to ask you about um, China. You mentioned during your remarks uh, that you expected it to be contentious when you were there, but, but again, the importance of interdependence between uh, the US and China, a number of fronts. What, what, is, what do you think is a takeaway message for leaders in, in Beijing, for example, in the case that TPP um, is ratified and under the opposite scenario of a failure for Congress to move the agreement forward. How, how do you think the, the, what do you think, how do you think the Chinese would, in, would interpret this? Well, I mean, I'd only go back to my practical experience. It, it certainly, politically, they're, they're, they certainly, uh, th I mean, this obviously has their attention. I don't think there's any question about that. But it can't help but have their attention economically as well. And uh, I, I, again, I go back to uh, that interdependency that we have between the economy, just the two of us now. Uh, and I can't believe that, that inside the 12 countries that that doesn't become uh, a, uh, a dominant force as well. And I think uh, opportunities at a time where, from my perspective, where the Chinese through their military actions uh, uh, seemingly are pushing the countries, the local, the, the countries in the region further and further away from them. Uh, it seems to me that, that there would be be an opportunity. I mean, it, it's, it's, it wouldn't be, uh, it's gonna it would have to be work, but there would be a great opportunity for China to engage with and interact with, you know, this, this, the, the totality of this group, the 12 countries, in, in a way that in the long run could be constructive mm -hmm. to their economy and, uh, and their, I mean, uh, President Xi and, and his follow on and his follow on are, going to continue to be challenged to grow that economy to take care of more and more of the have-nots in China, some seven or eight hundred million, billion, million, sorry. Um, 
so I, I would like to think, and I'm a glass half full guy, I would like to think that they could use this constructively. Uh, if we don't get to a point, I mean, if we don't take ourselves out of that discussion before it ever passes yeah. or as it passes because of other political imperatives. So I, want, I promise I'd leave time for questions. I'm sure there are many questions for the, for the Admiral. Uh, first hand I see is in the back in the second and last row. A microphone will come over to you. If you could please identify yourself, your name, and uh, affiliation before I ask you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Kami Bhatta. I'm with the Pakistani Spectator. In your speech, Pakistani you what? Spectator. In your speech, you said that when economy is struggling, some leader can take advantage of that. In, in the light of your that saying, have you noticed that Washington is literally run by lobbyists? They pump millions of dollars, and they run Washington indirectly. Maybe this is the thing that the people who vote for Donald Trump, they understood that Washington doesn't have to be run by lobbyists. So my question is this. People were saying that he was not going to be a candidate for the Republican Party, but he won. And given no politician in Washington has so much baggage as Secretary Clinton has, Sir, could Donald Trump might Sir, win you? the election. So Sir, if he wins the election, do you see the role of TPP contracting rather than expanding? Thanks. Um, I certainly don't want to leave the impression that I have selected one candidate over another. I, I agree with you completely that Mr. Trump has, has hit a vein, if you will, uh, that's tied directly to the dysfunction in Washington, D.C., in its totality, which, which I was talking about in terms of uh, not being able to let go of the politics and do what is substantively correct. I don't know how this comes out in November. Uh, certainly, everything that we've predicted about Mr. Trump has, has uh, been wrong. So those that might predict now that he isn't going to win, certainly from my perspective, I try to be a learning person or a learning organization, uh, that uh, to count him out, I think at this point, would be, would be uh, crazy. Um, uh, I would hope clearly when I've at, been asked about the political paralysis in Washington over many years now, it is the way I have summarized it is uh, the American, I believe in our system, I believe that we, we will, the American people will eventually get to the answer, and I used to describe it as throw the bums out, uh, and this may be it. I, do, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Next question here in the front row. Microphone's coming to you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Admiral. My name is Paolo von Schirach, president of the Global Policy Institute. Um, a little bit tied to your general remarks about the changing of the of the atmosphere, he, uh, in the, not just in Washington yeah. but in the nation. It seems to me that the opposition to this uh, trade agreement is really bipartisan at this point. You, you know that the irony that there is a Democratic administration that is pushing it, and Republicans that traditionally have been you know, on the forefront of free trade, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. are against. But let's not forget the Democratic uh, challengers, are, are, or rather candidates, uh, have uh, shared this, uh, the, more or less uh, the same intense feeling against uh, free trade and globalization, et cetera. Now, from your perspective, and I understand that you, know, you, you don't want to get into politics here, but uh, the, why is it that there has been this radical transformation in terms of the perception of American public opinion as to the benefits, the pros and cons of tree trade? You know, we've moved, uh, we, use, we convened the, Pre the Bretton Woods Conference. We've been in the forefront of all these efforts of trade liberalization uh, back, you know, on, on every possible level. And now we have uh, veered towards a, a very, very different environment, yeah. which I really think is bipartisan. And, uh, you know, and I don't really think that that uh, augurs well for uh, passing this particular uh, agreement now, let alone whoever the new president is going to be. But, but the core question is really, why is it that the general perception of Americans now is that free trade and globalizations is a bad deal for America? So we, we I think, uh, clearly we've passed free trade agreements. We passed NAFTA in the, in the 90s. Uh, and then I think then this comes to the fore. Um, and I think it hits it, its visibility, its timing, hits at the core issue of the economic future of the United States, in particular with what's happened 
to the middle class. And I use that, I use that term broadly uh, because sometimes it's difficult to understand exactly what we're talking about that. When we, but when we talk about what hasn't happened with our wages, there's sort of two aspects of this. One is the middle class and their uh, certainly the, the dimming, if you will, of some level of hope to, to achieve the American dream, certainly over the last 30 to 40 years. And then you have those without who uh, I think have virtually no hope. And so how does American leadership provide for their future? And then does this help or does it not help? Uh, and I think it's, it, it's uh, uh, for those of us who are in support of it, uh, uh, it, it's up to us to try to make the case that, and in my case, it's the linkage between security and prosperity, uh, very specifically. But I also believe the world is changing. The job market is changing. It is, it is not deniable. And for us to basically try to, uh, in, in terms of execution, denying that that's going to happen, which w in, in fact should create more competition, uh, I think at the heart of this, if you take the U.S. out of this, you're creating less competition. You're actually exposing our commercial side to, I can't remember what the number was, a staggering number of tariffs around the world that we have to figure out how to get above in order to become, be commercially viable, make profits, et cetera. I just, my own belief is I think you pull it in the wrong direction. That doesn't mean I think, I think an understanding of the ideological mixed change, if you will, uh, on both sides of this is, is very important. One of the real challenges right now, I think in DC, is getting to the facts. What, what are the facts? Because they don't often get picked up in the political rhetoric. That's, that's part of the problem. So that's what I was saying earlier. We have to have individuals who will stand up and actually cash in some of the credibility that they have, some of the political capital to make the right thing happen. I've last, I don't know, dozen or years so in this town, I've seen less and less of that. And then if it doesn't happen, we're for the same reasons it doesn't happen, we're, we're a dozen years out at best. I mean, or so. Um, at a time where I think, econ I think from an economic standpoint, from a job creation standpoint, from a competing in the future standpoint, from a, from a prosperity and security linkage standpoint, we have great opportunity. And how do you, how do you make that case in the, outside of Washington, which is, which is where, you, where you find a lot of the resistance to, to, uh, to free trade? I think you go, to, well, I don't think you go to the people. I think you've got to go to the critics, if you will, as opposed to go into just friendly environs. If, and, and so you need to go where we've lost jobs. You need to go to the Rust Belt. You need to go to the industries that not just to, to look at the history, which is, which can be, which is pretty tough, um, but you also need to go to those industries and the people that we see change coming in, and instead of just executing the change and saying, good luck to you, figure that out ahead of time to give them a future, to give them, uh, and I, I don't want, job training's almost, it's almost too trite, creating new careers for their futures uh, in a world where we're all living longer. Uh, many of us are going to work longer. But that's got to be very active uh, you know, around the country. And, and actually, if, you, if someone or if, if, that, if you were to take that approach, that has a way of feeding back to Washington to say, hey, it's different this time. Yeah. I think we have time for one last quick question. Um, yes, in the back row there. Hello, good afternoon. Alberto Hart from the Embassy of Peru. I wonder if I could bring it back to the uh, security strategic dimension, but um, you've talked about quite a bit about the Asian dimension. Um, something that gets a little bit left out in the, in the conversation is the strategic uh, dimension with Latin America. Now, the Latin American economies that are participating in TPP, Peru, uh, Chile, Mexico, eventually maybe some other neighbor countries, have been very much aligned in terms of economic policy but we're, we don't exist in a vacuum. We know that there's other alternatives, and you mentioned some of the countries, I'm not going to mention them, which are now starting to look to this, to this model. So 
what I'm asking is if you could comment on what type of message you think um, an eventual blockage or delay uh, that could send to our, our neighborhood, to our, um, to our region um, in terms of TPP and its strategic dimension. I think in its essence it becomes, is the United States leading anymore? And wondering about U.S. leadership uh, in what is, I would argue, the most important part of our portfolio. And can we even deliver in an area in which we've always led anymore? Uh, and, I mean, and, and as you say, and I'm hugely concerned about how we do this in particular with Latin America. I mean, I think sort of, uh, you know, this half of the world from the North Pole to the South Pole, there's tremendous opportunity to support each other, to leverage who we are, leverage our economies, our peoples, our common interests, our values in a world that's pretty confused and pretty uncertain. And I think certainly the economic connection uh, is, is key to that as well. But I think fundamentally that becomes the question is, is the United States leading in the world anymore? As Governor Huntsman said in the beginning, we at the Atlantic Council are, have continued, have uh, from the beginning uh, been a staunch advocate of the importance of, of free trade for a number of reasons, including the linkage between uh, security yeah. and prosperity uh, and, our, uh, and see the many benefits of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So um, I'm going to, again, thank you, Admiral Mullen, Thanks. for your excellent Thanks. comments, for coming back to Washington for this great yeah. conversation, and the Governor Huntsman for your opening comments. And I also thank my colleague Maria Fernanda Perez in the first row who put this entire uh, event together. And thank you, all of you, for, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.